Wonderful. Thank you and welcome for joining us today. Once again, I'm Jane Tesner Kleiner, the program manager for the Lower Columbia Nature Network. We're really excited that you could take your time today to join us for the third installment of Taking Lessons Outdoors, Connections to Classroom Learning, uh, session number three. This is a partnership with the ESD 112, uh, the Lower Columbia School Gardens based in Longview, Washington, the WSU Extension Master Gardener uh, School Garden Coordinator Program, retired science teacher and school board member Mark Watron, and the Lower Columbia Nature Network. We're excited to bring this partnership training to you to support your work in outdoor learning. Like I said, this is training number three in the series of three. And these, thresh, these three sessions that you've been watching on Zoom, along with your asynchronous learning activities, can earn you up to six STEM clock hours once you've completed all the tasks. Now, session three today, as I mentioned, is connections to classroom learning with Mark. And we'll get to Mark in just a little bit here. Let me keep uh, checking the weight room. Um, and I wanted to remind you at the end of the session, I'll put a link in the chat box uh, for another session that we're planning that is free to you. Uh, we don't have any clock hours associated, but at March 21st from 4 to 5.30 p.m., we will have an online Zoom training with John Muir Laws using nature journaling as a tool for outdoor learning. I'll get you that link uh, towards the end of the session, but it's free and he's a resource that the Lower Col Columbia Nature Network is bringing for you. Now, uh, I'm gonna put in the chat box uh, another uh, set of uh, links here for you uh, that as a reminder, um, you do need to complete all three uh, of the asynchronous learning and it needs to be more than TBD <laughs> to be done later. We need actually to do the research and make sure you get that in there. So if you uh, didn't have time to complete it, we know that schedules got all messed up with the snow days, et cetera. Go ahead and go back in, use those links to make sure that you've got your information in there so we can add it to our tally so that we can get you your clock hours. I get everybody's super busy. So no worries if you put TBD and you get back to it. We'd ask that you finish all of that work by March 8th, if you could please. Um, and later on today, I will uh, send a link for the attendance for today. Um, it does have the similar questions that we had in the last session, um, plus a couple other questions that we want to get your feedback on these sessions. If you could take the time to fill that out, that would be great. Uh, we want to make sure this is working for everybody. Okay, now we're going to get started with Mark. Mark Watcher from Battleground School District. Welcome, Mark. Uh, we do have a poll that I'm going to launch here uh, related to the asynchronous work that you did. Um, this should just take you a minute or two to fill out. I'm launching, and there it is. Hopefully you can all see that. Thumbs up. Can you see the poll? Awesome. Go ahead and take a minute to answer some of those questions for us, and then we'll take a look at the poll. And the first question is, what uh, grade level are you looking at for the NGSS? And the second one is related to the, the little uh, uh, productive conversations and which one of those works really well for you and your students. And then just a general question about which curriculum topics do you think you want to use when you teach outside? Because there's more than science you can teach outdoors as you all know. And for those folks who are just joining us, um, we do have a poll on the screen. Feel free to join us in the poll right now before we get started. And we'll just give you another uh, minute here to get those filled in. We're at 36, 38. Got just a few more folks to answer the poll and then we'll, uh, we'll end it. But it looks like most folks are teaching science outdoors, a little bit of language arts, some social and emotional learning. That's great. Uh, lots of folks are going to be asking for evidence from their students. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah. In a, a range of grades here, this is really great because yeah. kindergarten all the way up through high school into college, these, these are all skills that folks can take, uh, take forward in their life. So this is great. We have 41, 42 folks. Uh, we have just a few more folks to fill in. And we'll give you a 15 more seconds if you could, and then we'll end the poll. 
Well, this is great. So Mark, now you know your audience. It's yeah, every that grade. helps a lot. Yeah, it, it's every grade. Um, folks are gonna use all of those tools to engage their students in conversations. That was a really great resource. Thanks for sharing that, Mark. Lots of science, but lots of other uh, uh, things Topic being. Well. Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm going to end the poll now. And it's going to ask me to share the results. Hopefully, you can see that. Lots of good things going on here. Okay. Great, well, thanks for taking the time to fill that out for us. Really appreciate it. I'll stop sharing that. And Mark, I will stop sharing my screen if you wanna share yours and feel free to take it away. And I will monitor the chat for questions as they come up, but thank you again, Mark, for your time. Yeah. And everybody for being here today, thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody being willing to switch from the Monday pattern to Tuesday. I had a five hour school board meeting yesterday. So that would have been a tough one to, uh, to fit in. Uh, I thank, want to thank you for your participation. I watched the first recording with Ian and, and I was able to sit in on the second one live and uh, really impressed with your uh, questions and, and curiousness uh, for this and your, your passion for this. Really kids are the winners from your participation in this uh, series that's been going on and, and uh, really appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, uh, I'm an active, a retired uh, science teacher. I'm a school board member at uh, in the Battleground School District. Uh, I like to make my claim to fame as being one of the co-founders of the Casey Project in the Battleground School District. It's a magnet environmental science school uh, for high school students there, uh, but also hosts um, hundreds of kids on outdoor field trips. Uh, at that site. I'm a garden advocate, love it, uh, and uh, also helped uh, the state when we adopted our next generation science standards in helping teachers learn those. Uh, so I'm immersed in um, information about trying to help teachers uh, better use their science standards in particular. Um, and uh, I'm uh, get your elbows dirty, garden coordinator for my two closest gardens, uh, Gledwind Elementary School and, and Lauren Middle School, which are, uh, are, are close to my house. Uh, I'm hoping I can do uh, justice in reinforcing just the super eloquent way that Ian uh, described why getting kids involved in school gardens is uh, uh, such an important deal and, and what the benefits from that are. And likewise, uh, Becca's uh, how to's that we heard in the last session. Um, I'll, I'll try to reinforce those as much as possible. But my theme is really, what are the activities and things that you can do that have the highest value in connecting students activities in their school garden with their school curriculum? And even though every school uses um, slightly maybe different materials, uh, we all work towards the uh, same standards. All right, with that as an introduction, and I got to see your uh, grade levels and uh, your request about emphasis on the talk moves and uh, the subjects that you use while you're out in the garden. But if you have specific requests or questions during uh, this next hour and a half or uh, hour and 20 minutes, uh, I'd love to hear what those are. I mean, if, if you want me to drill down into a certain things and you could be grade level specific if you want, you say, I've never understood why this is a standard for this or something like that. Uh, go ahead and put those in the chat and um, um, that'll give me a chance to scan through some of those uh, as we get started and make sure that I work those in if I can. We will make sure that we reserve time at the end uh, for questions that uh, you can do it as well. Okay. While you're doing that, one other special request. Find yourself a piece of paper, just a regular eight and a half by 11 that you can put in the landscape mode and fold it. So we make ourselves a mini four page science notebook 
that we're going to use during this presentation. So piece of paper, pencil, and if you check the chat you saw I put in there earlier, there's going to be a time or two where I say, hold your picture up to the screen so I can see it. And Mark, just for uh, if in the chat, it says uh, we do have somebody with a preschool uh, class here. So if you uh, can include preschool in your thinking, that would be great. I like it. Uh, I, I hope it'll be general enough that it would include uh, preschool. But if I find a special opportunity, I'll put that in there. Thank you. Okay, if you have any, uh, put them in there along the way. Uh, I have several pauses built in where I wanna check in so we don't have to leave everything uh, to the end uh, as we go along. Um, you're gonna hear me talk a little bit about standards uh, and also a little bit about why they're brain friendly. Uh, one of the standards that we have in science is called a cross-cutting concept and it's how kids understand. And one of those ways that kids understand is patterns uh, in an attempt to blatantly get you to pay attention. Uh, in the first three slides, I'll let you know when those start, I've embedded a pattern that I want you to look for. And I'll, I'll let you know, actually, it's not, it's not the first three, but I'll let you know when I start with the first slide that, that uh, we have that pattern in. And then I'll pause and see if you can find that uh, pattern as we go along the way. Ah, there we go. Let's see if I'm oh, good, I can go backwards. All right. Um, as I was doing standards work, um, I discovered in talking to teachers that in the design of those standards, sometimes there was a little bit of a mismatch between how standards were written for English language arts, math, even social studies and science. And so I'm putting this up there quickly. If this is new to you, Great. If it uh, needs to be reinforced, that's great as well. Um, if not, uh, thanks for hanging in there. I just realized that we started this effort with the Next Generation Science Standards in 2013. So these have now been out there 10 years. Hard to believe um, when they consider standards having about a 20 year lifespan or we're middle age already. Uh, and yet, I think it still bears uh, repeating, uh, putting that in there. So the one thing that people struggle a little bit with, if you follow my cursor, I'll get rid of the chat room for a minute there. Uh, in all the other subject standards, when you look at it, this funny little code and letter number that they put on these things, and then a statement after that is what the standard is. And so for English language arts, for math, for social studies, there's this little code number, and then there's a statement. Well, it turns out, don't ask me why, that's different for science, okay? So yes, there's still the code number and there's the uh, statement that comes after it, but that is actually a recommended assessment. It's not even a required assessment. It's just a recommended. This would be a good assessment to look for our kids accomplishing these three big areas down below. Uh, the science and engineering practice, we used to call that hands-on science. Our disciplinary core ideas, what we called content. And then these cross-cutting concepts, and this is probably a really key one. This is how students understand. So there's three parts here. What are your students doing? What do we want them to know fact-wise? And how are they gonna link those facts together in a pattern, for example, of understanding? All right, I'm gonna pause there for a minute. Uh, maybe use your response there. If this is familiar to you, would you do a thumbs up? Uh, I don't know if there's a question mark in there. What that people can do. I'm not sure I can see that. 
Jane, can you see the responses? Yes, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs going up. Okay, good, good. Oh. Bob even gave us a double thumbs up. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so actually, I had it in here a little bit, but I'll I'll come back. So this is where I'm I'm starting my my pattern search here. All right. So uh, today, you know, see my title is your classroom is as big as your schoolyard. Uh, so these are my three main messages that I really really want to get across, and that is the number one. Um, I I really believe your classroom is as big as your schoolyard if you if you decide to take advantage of it. Uh, I think we heard uh, Ian and Becca both say. There's many right ways to use your schoolyard and garden. Quite honestly, you can't get it wrong as long as you're taking kids outside and hopefully with a with a purpose to take advantage of. Uh, but it, you know, I have to tell you, um, I've got a granddaughter in first grade, and her teacher takes them out to the school garden every day, rain or shine, to have snack and. Just think of that over the school year, 180 visits, even though they're small, each time they're seeing something just a little bit different, the changes as the weather changes, all those kinds of things. She doesn't have any big science lesson or message that goes with it, but that's an example of, that's a right answer still, right? Those kids are getting out there. I, I've had them send me emails because I help out with that garden as well. Uh, I have them send me emails. I go, we saw this today, you know, but what's that about? And so uh, many right ways. So message number two, many right ways to use your schoolyard and garden. It's hard to get it wrong. Uh, and then my third message in that really is I think of the schoolyard and the school garden really just like I think of pencil, paper, ruler, calculator. They're just all tools at my disposal to help me get to the standards that I'm expected to teach, right? Uh, and as long as I have a tool available, why not use it? I think that's an important uh, key. All right. All right, if you are familiar, and it sounds like you were from the thumbs up uh, with the Next Generation Science Standards, they introduced a term that's maybe a little bit unique. I, I'm still getting comfortable with it, but they talked about the idea of phenomena, engaging kids in phenomena, uh, whether that's real learning or however you wanna rephrase that, this term phenomenon became uh, a, a key idea. And I wanna explain the background on that. The phenomena, term came from a research book called How People Learn. And um, it was a broad study that led to several things in the standards movement, but the science standards in particular. And there were three key learnings in how people learn, okay? First of all, that they come to our gardens with a wealth of information already and a wealth of misinformation. Um, I always like to pick on Uncle Fred. I don't know if Uncle Fred actually exists or not, but Uncle Fred works with his grandkids or uh, kids or whatever it happens to be. And he's very well-meaning, but he doesn't always give accurate information, right? And I've heard kids time and again say, well, my uncle, my whoever told me this, you know, and so we have to work with that, right? We don't want to just maybe come out and say, hmm, well, Fred's wrong, <laughs> right? So we want to say, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder how he got that information, right? And um, so kids already have a wealth of information. It's not equal. Some kids have more experience. Some have, kids have less. And they also have a collection of misinformation that goes with it. Uh, and maybe I should call that preconceptions as well. Uh, sometimes misinformation sounds negative. Um, some of the, the information they have, even though not quite accurate scientifically, uh, is the normal steps that kids take towards learning. And we just want to help them along that pathway. Okay. All right. So that was the first thing that uh, how people learn said. 
Second thing how people uh, learn said is you're better off to do fewer topics more in depth than you are to do a mile wide and an inch deep. Okay, so um, the original science standards were highly criticized uh, when they came out, even though they were better than nothing, uh, for being a mile wide and an inch deep. There was just way too much there. Uh, and the next generation science standards, even though I'm sure I get some um, agreement from some people that there's still too much there, um, they were at least an attempt to say, let's do fewer things uh, more in depth. And here's something you may not realize about that. Um, there are three big ideas that we're gonna talk about later. And those three big ideas kind of in each subject area actually carry through from kindergarten through 12th grade. So think about that for a minute. If all teachers were aware that there's three basic big ideas say in the life sciences, and they're gonna be reinforced every year for 13 years. You know, a kid's got a fighting chance of learning that big idea if every teacher was in fact aware of that. So we'll find out in a little bit whether you're aware of what are those fewer topics that we wanna go more in depth. All right. The third piece, which is why I put in that resource, uh, Talk Science, is that students really benefit from a teacher modeling in front of them how they think and learn new information and then discussing that with them, right? Uh, we, some, we expect kids to do some of this on their own, but it really benefits them if the teacher kind of plays the role and says, hmm, I wonder what the evidence is for that, or hmm, I'm not sure I know that, even if they already do, just to help the kids uh, see how somebody processes information. Uh, and that's where the talk science resource uh, comes in. All right, so that's where the phenomenon came from. Um, and we'll, we'll work that. Okay, here we go. Find your piece of paper and your pencil. And here's your first task. Phenomenon is brain friendly. It's based on that science uh, or science study, how people learn. I am almost positive that every person on the call today has seen that classic diagram in their biology book or some other like book of the brain with the various senses written in or maybe even color coded on that brain. Like where's your center of vision? Where's your center of hearing? Things like that. Here's what I want you to do. Take your paper. I want you to draw on the front cover a human brain with the senses labeled in on the brain. Hopefully we've got some pretty good heads of cauliflower looking diagrams coming up there. Uh, if you want to do kids a little coaching about making scientific diagrams, I like to use the acronym ABCD, which stands for accurate, big, colorful, and details, which means adding labels to it. Okay, there's no grades here, but here we go. Get your brains up there. I wanna see some brains on the screen. Oop. 
It's going to take me a minute to scroll through the pictures. All right. Oh, I see some good ones. It's hard. Oh, thank you for labeling nice and big on that one. That's great. Okay. Now, that one looks like a speech bubble. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Good. Thank you for playing along with that. We have a couple other diagrams to do along the way as well. Uh, so I want to mention that um, school gardening and this idea of using phenomenon is very brain friendly. And I like to quote my favorite brain scientist, Ken Wesson. He happened to work for the FOSS Science Kit Company, came to several uh, conventions. And he said, you know, if your job is to work with young minds and help them develop their brain, and or if you own a brain, shouldn't you know how it works and how it goes, how you can make it better? And so uh, I've always taken that to, to heart that the more I can learn about uh, activities that are brain friendly and school gardening is a great example of that. Now, why is that? It's really the idea of multi-sensory, the more different ways that kids can take information and connect it together, the stronger those connections are. And let's see, I think I'm going on to the next question there, okay. All right, so uh, phenomenon, a key idea, school gardens are full of phenomenon. Uh, we can take advantage of that. It's really a multi-sensory approach uh, and uh, that's always gonna be a, a benefit to kids, okay? Uh, this is a reinforcement of my uh, three components of the science standards. So our content, what they experience here uh, in the middle, that's our phenomenon, how the kids engage in that phenomenon, asking questions, planning and carrying out investigations, constructing explanations from the information and sometimes the misinformation they have, and then talking about that and engaging in argument from evidence is what helps them build these deeper understandings the patterns, the systems, the cause and effect that are part of those cross-cutting concepts. All right, so I'm gonna pause, get ready to chat. This should be fairly quick. So in my first three slides, I embedded a pattern and I wanna see if you think you might know the pattern. So in the chat, Put in what you think the pattern was in my first three slides. Ah, there it is, man. Okay, I like it. Uh, you, you guys found patterns that I didn't intend, which is great. <laughs> uh, so I did try to uh, include three components in each of the slides to go along with the three uh, sections of the Next Generation Science Standards uh, that went in there, uh, the three components of the how people learn and so on. So I saw, I saw at least one person like, Everybody else liked the colors, which is good too. I mean, that's, that's a good one in there. Okay. Let's see. All right. Uh, this actually continues my pattern. Uh, going to our message about many, white, many right ways to use your garden. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm aware that uh, people all have different resources that uh, they use. Uh, and one way is to coordinate with that particular resource. Uh, I happen to be real involved with the FOSS science kits, but I'm also very familiar with the uh, STC kits that are in Vancouver. 
Uh, and I've kept up with the trend towards mystery science uh, as they've developed theirs. And uh, I might mention in that uh, mystery science series, if you know what to look for, you'll see it in a minute, uh, those three big ideas in each of the main subject areas is really obvious when you know what they are, uh, that you can see those built into the mystery science uh, component. Uh, I'm gonna use these as an example. Uh, so in the two or three school gardens that I uh, am involved in, uh, I use and put things in those gardens that specifically complement the curriculum for those particular school districts. In, in the garden that I worked with in Vancouver, that's the STC kits. Uh, in the gardens I work with in Battleground, that's the FOSS science kits. Um, and the uh, ESD versions of the FOSS science kits are very consistent um, as well with all of these. So in each garden, I try to include a composting area so that there's worms and isopods available. Um, we specifically make room for uh, bulbs and cutting, which cuttings which are built into the uh, first grade. Uh, we might uh, take on a task to work on making pollinator friendly components. Uh, in the science kits, they come with marigold seeds. Uh, I saw a lot of second grade teachers on the, the, uh, the list. Uh, compost is great for all the different kinds of insects and things uh, and for your soils, rocks and landforms uh, components as well. Uh, for third grade, uh, I'll try to make sections specifically for corn. I like to do the uh, Native American corn because it's going to fit in a minute, as you'll see with the um, stories in the ELA components. Uh, and uh, wheat, celery, all those kinds of things. So I, I purposely say, I know these are experiences kids are gonna have if you're doing the curriculum in your science kits, let's go ahead and put them in our garden and, and we can see them in another setting, okay? But that's only one right way, okay? You don't have to do it that way. Uh, another right way is to have the students help us engineer the existing school garden or school yard and say, how could we make it better? and get their ideas. And that really goes along with the engineering standards in the next generation science standards. Have them define uh, how good is our schoolyard or where does it need to be improved? Find ways to test uh, and put that together. And then hopefully actually be able to carry out some of those. Um, a recent example uh, that I have in the Battleground School District at Pleasant Valley, their green team, which is uh, primarily second graders, um, did went through that process with me and they decided they wanted a pollinator garden, which was also consistent with their green schoolyards uh, task. And so we got the plants and the seeds and, and so on. And they picked the places that they would best fit in and could be taken care of uh, and, and put that together. Uh, another one is to get kids involved in uh, citizen science activities. So pollinator gardens is a good one. Uh, Project Bud Burst, if you're not familiar with it, is looking at flowering times and really coordinating with the seasons. And of course, schoolyard bird counts or wildlife counts uh, go along with that. Uh, and I recently learned um, that is uh, another brain friendly thing that we um, uh, probably see all, all the time with people trying to sell us things or get us to do things a certain way. Uh, when kids think that they're part of a larger movement, like helping pollinators or um, doing bird counts to assess things, uh, there's some real uh, social engineering that goes on there that, that, again, makes that brain friendly. They feel like they're part of a bigger movement, uh, and that's a key component. Thanks, I had to flip my notes. Okay, I saw quite a few people put it in there that they're interested not only in the uh, science standards, but they use their school gardens for uh, other kinds of things as well. And uh, these are some ex examples that we have done, again, by putting in uh, specific things in our gardens, knowing that we have, say, an English language arts resource that goes with that. 
uh, then we think we can really uh, multiply the effect of that. And so uh, I put a little bit of wheat. Now for the FOSS science kits, wheat comes in the kit. You can grow it in your paper cup or uh, plastic container that you have, but it actually grows uh, quite well. You don't need that much. I put some in as a border in one garden. I put it in a small corner uh, of a raised bed in another garden. Uh, but now when we do our story of wheat, we actually have the wheat plant uh, sometimes in its small young stage, which actually is perfect for the science standard where a kid should uh, compare the young and the adult of the same species. Um, of course, they immediately think of animals and a lot of examples are animals, but having them realize that there's a young and an adult stage of a plant is a, is a good way to expand that and get that depth of knowledge as well. Uh, one of my very favorite stories is the story of uh, Barbara McClintock, a Nobel Prize winning uh, uh, vegetable scientist who did studies on uh, jumping genes and genetics in corn, uh, which believe it or not is a third grade standard. We're already introducing kids to the concept of genetics and that plants come in families and that they're either closely related or not as closely related. Um, so um, those are great examples and the, the power of using both our ELA resources and our actual science experience, again, is one of those brain-friendly practices. And just because it's one of my favorite resources, um, you can get it through the uh, National Science Teachers Association, uh, and I'm sure you could get it through Amazon and many other places, but a great series, the Next Time You See series by Emily Morgan uh, is one of my favorite for looking at uh, some of the outdoor areas. There's one on bees, there's one on even the moon and the sun, uh, but lots on, on basic natural phenomenon. Um, large picture style books, great for uh, preschool, uh, through uh, others, um, and that and and the information is sophisticated enough that um, it can even help up into uh, middle school and, and upper grades. Uh, so friendly for lots of different grade levels. All right, so here's one of my messages here. Anytime we can integrate our curriculum, that's really the core of what STEM or STEAM is. And I, I've heard them start to put some new labels like outdoor STEM or e-STEM or things like that. Uh, but really it's that core idea of the more we can marshal multiple subjects, English language arts, math, science, social studies, art, and give the kids that, that's where that depth of experience that goes along with how people learn of fewer things more in depth. With that in mind, I'm going to have you, got to find my page. Okay, open your notebook to the inside of that front page. I need to take a break from talking anyway and give you some drawing time. Okay, in the middle of that page, just draw a big circle that takes up most of the middle of that page. Draw a line to the top of the page, the bottom of the page, and to the two sides so that you make four sections. And in the middle, Write the word STEM or STEAM, whichever your preferred acronym is. And in the four corners, uh, you can do this as I've already done this. So this is how I routinely do it just to reinforce this. Uh, or this is what I could do, uh, put an example of uh, a science 
standard or activity that you do in your school garden, say in the upper left hand corner. And next to it, put an example of a math standard or activity that you might do in the school garden. Let's say in the lower left-hand side, put a story that you like to read or a ELA resource that you say, hey, this connects really well with our school garden or schoolyard activities. And in your fourth square, you got lots of choice, whether it's social studies, art, music, or as I saw somebody else in there, also some of that uh, social emotional value that we get from using those outdoor school spaces. That's a good one to put in there as well. All right, let's see him, put them up to the screen. I'm gonna have a hard time reading these, but I'll give it a shot. Ah, oh, yeah, I like it. Perfect. Thank you for writing big, my eyes need it. Okay, great, you've got the idea, okay? Um, really, and I, I think, I, I hope actually your uh, clock hours here qualify as STEM credits because um, that's a, a key component is we can do lots of integration in the school garden and in the schoolyard. And at its core, that's what STEM and STEAM is. It's, it's applying all of our available resources to solving problems, um, which happen in lots of arenas. Okay, we're gonna stick with our, um, piece of paper, so go to page three, the other inside page of your notebook. And here's your challenge. This is kind of my formative assessment. Uh, now, this is gonna be a little bit like reading my mind, which is not fair at all. And so I'm accepting all answers for sure. But here's your challenge. There are in fact, three big ideas built into the life science standards. There's three big ideas built into the earth space standards. There's three big ideas built into the uh, physical science standards that are in fact repeated every year for all 13 years of a, a student's uh, career. Do the best you can, see what you could come up with. If you only had three big ideas to help kids understand in their life science, we're picking the life science in particular, what would they be? I'm gonna pause and be quiet for a minute. Write that on your paper. Mark, could you please repeat the uh, quest here that you have for our audience? Yes, I can. Yes, did that come in in the chat or something like that? Okay, uh, yes. open my chat room. Okay, yes. All right, so your task or challenge is if you only had three big ideas that you could really help kids understand in the life science area, what are those three big ideas?
I want to give you plenty of thinking time there. there we go. Okay. All right. We'll see how we do. So here we go. Now, this is my phrasing of them, but I was involved when they were writing the Next Generation Science Standards, and um, these were stated uh, during that time and at least close to that. So we'll see how this looks to you. I think, oh, I got to click it right there. Here we go. All right, these three big ideas are built in every single grade level all the way through their science experience. The key for us is to know that they were built in there and be part of that 13 year reinforcement of these big ideas. So number, number one, what does it mean to be and stay alive? Okay, helping kids understand what a living thing is. Our, our topic is life science. So what does it mean to be alive? And of course, that explanation is very different for a preschooler than it is for a high schooler, right? So we want to build our depth of knowledge around this big idea. And it is perfectly okay for a preschooler to say that, hmm, mostly just animals and things uh, that move around and move quickly are alive, right? And they have a tough time thinking that something like a plant is alive, but we can help them build that idea, okay? Second big idea is what role does each living organism play in its environment? What's it doing out there? Uh, this is a great one that kids come with a common misconception that we should all know about. Uh, most kids think that all living things out there are there for them, right? That their purpose is to be for people, you know, whether it's vegetables in the grocery store uh, or trees that provide them shade, uh, or in some cases, there are things that they have to stay away from, like bees that might sting them, right? But they're, they're very self-focused in why living things are out there in the environment. And of course, we want to help them build over time that all of those living things have their own life independent of whether humans are there or not, right? And so what is that role? And, and in the simplest terms, these are our food webs and our food chains and our interactions between uh, living things in, in the environment. The third big idea, which I hinted at earlier with the Barbara McClintlock story, is how do we know how closely related organisms are? Right? Uh, this is, gets into that idea of genetics. So what evidence is there that all living things use a common genetic information system? And again, that looks very different at preschool or first grade, although there is a specific first grade standard that helps kids start that journey um, on how we know that living things are related. So starting in first grade with things like, how do we know the, what the young look like compared to the adults? And then later on, uh, how do we know if they're part of the same family? Uh, so uh, actually, I believe in first grade with the science kits, they have them grow all different kinds of grasses. So grasses are a group that's more closely related to each other than they are to other kinds of plants. Uh, and so those activities have those things built into them. We just don't always know that they were built in there for us, right? So there's those three big ideas that students get reinforced every single year. All right, I'm gonna pause for a minute and see if there's any questions about this because this is like really the key, one of the key ideas. I'll open up my chat box. Feel free to unmute yourself as well if you have Oh yeah, you can do that too. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay. Okay, well, let's see if I can do an example. 
All right, so this is from the Glenwood Elementary School School Garden in which we included potatoes um, in the FOSS kits. Usually uh, you get some potatoes, hopefully already slightly sprouted uh, with the idea that they would plant those in the classroom uh, and get them going. And so let's say we were to apply that to this uh, activity, right? Uh, having a question like, when the tops turn brown, is the potato dead or is it still alive? Having kids struggle with that. It, it makes perfect sense for them to say, oh, if it's all brown and dry, it can't be alive anymore, right? But then we can take that potato, put it in good conditions with warmth and soil uh, and some water. And all of a sudden, we've got a living growing potato again, right? So now they have to rethink their idea. Hmm, I was pretty sure that potato was dead, right? Uh, I, I can't believe that a potato on the grocery store shelf is actually a living thing, right? It just doesn't seem like it. It doesn't move. It doesn't do any of those things that we expect living things to do. So helping kids struggle with what that idea of what it means to be a lot, okay? Uh, you can see my potatoes here in the middle. So just a quick observation, and this is why going out to the garden is a great multi-sensory experience. You might go to the garden, dig up the potatoes and go, oh my goodness, our garden is ruined, right? Heck no, this is an opportunity to say, hey, who's eating these potatoes and why is this happening and, and who's getting the benefit out of that uh, and have them come up with explanations. Uh, when I plant potatoes in school gardens, I purposely plant white, red, and purple potatoes. Okay, and it's usually not that hard to find those as a source uh, these days anyway. Uh, I prefer garden stores over the grocery store because in fact, sometimes grocery store potatoes are treated with a non-sprouting uh, substance that makes them a little harder to sprout, but they do work. They do work. So now we can ask the question, our third big idea, how closely related are these potatoes, right? They're all, we call them potatoes, they're all potatoes, but they clearly have some differences as well. So are they brothers and sisters? Are they cousins? Are they distant cousins? Um, you know, are they not very closely related at all? And it's again, it's engaging in that conversation around that that helps the kids build those ideas. And there's lots of great things that you can uh, do with this. I hope I saw a pretty good group of um, second grade teachers on the, on the list here. Um, many of you do the brassica fast growing plants in your classroom. Uh, investigating the brassica family is a wonderful way to have kids take a look at this because Brassica includes things like our cabbages, cauliflower, kale. Um, um, uh, what do I want to say, but just a wide variety of forms that don't look like uh, they should maybe be in the same family, but in fact they are. Um, so uh, finding some of those, uh, the various different varieties of corn, like I mentioned, the sweet corn and the Native American corn and so on. Uh, having kids engage in that idea of how closely related is something. All right, here we go. Uh, I hope my sound comes through. I expect this to be kind of noisy, so bear with the first 30 seconds or so. Um, and Jane, you can give me some feedback if you think I can improve it. Uh, but this is me at the Glenwood garden last time and we were engaging in some of this and uh, I was lucky enough to have the school principal uh, Antonio Lopez come out and used his phone as a, a filming method and so this is me engaged in the talk science with big ideas with Kevin here. Are dead? That's a clue that they're dead. Mm -hmm. Are there any seeds in there? 
That's always a good place to stop on that one. And, and, uh, uh, so I, I hope I, I put that in there because I just really wanted to um, uh, have an example of how when you are having those discussions with kids, remembering to slide in those uh, three big ideas whenever you get an opportunity uh, is what really helps kids kind of uh, work those things out. So. Oh. All right, I am going to switch gears. How am I doing on time, Jane? You're good. You've got about, uh, let's say, 15 more minutes max. Then we have time and for some questions. questions. Okay. And then wrap up. All right, I think, I think I'm OK on track with that, all right? Uh, so yeah, if you have more uh, questions about standards and or um, talk moves and things like that. Be glad to do that at the end. And I'll do the best I can to, to do justice to that. All right, I'm gonna switch uh, gears to a project that uh, we started here in the Battleground School District. Uh, we think we've gotten some good mileage out of it. And it goes back to my original message, which is your classroom is as big as your schoolyard. So I know school gardens are a real focus of this, but I actually like to think bigger than that and think about the, uh, the whole schoolyard as a potential garden, uh, which might include some of those landscapes and so on. Um, so uh, I'm offering this as a suggestion. Be glad to help people. If you want some personal help on that, we can maybe uh, work that out. But I think after you see the steps to this, it won't be that difficult. Uh, but what we did is we took um, basically uh, the satellite photos or the Google Maps picture of every school schoolyard. And we went through a process to then basically map and uh, identify all of the trees, shrubs, landscape areas, things that we could use as part of our um, deal. And this started as a kindergarten project um, and again, uh, connected in Battleground with the, the FOSS kits, but I also know the STC has some uh, similar things uh, because they have some of the activities of observing your schoolyard trees, adopting one of those trees, visiting that tree each and every season as it changes, uh, going around and collecting all the different varieties of leaves. This comes back to that, how closely are they related, right? If, if there's a bunch of maple type leaves with the classic uh, palmate veins with the uh, veins branching out from the bottom of the uh, leaf. Uh, the kids get that, there's that pattern, right? They see the pattern. Do they have parallel leaves? Do they have branching leaves? They can go with that. Uh, we can take a look at fall trees and then winter evergreens. How come some trees lose their leaves? Uh, and it really ties in with, particularly, I, I go with the the preschool to through second grade or so, um, really uh, the idea of observing the seasons and recognizing those changes uh, and, and even into their community uh, with some of the social studies um, standards that, that go along with that. Uh, so anyway, that was our, our project to pull that together. We've done that for every single school. We made it as a, a resource so that we put a copy in the office. Uh, some teachers may not even be aware that it's there. We have to remind people once in a while, uh, but we can pull that out. Uh, and then uh, as an example, 
last year, one of the things that we did is we actually organized a Earth Day event. This happened to be at a middle school. Um, and I, I can give more information on that as well. But we found this really nifty tool that's called a carbon calculator. And it's a measuring tape that you wrap around the tree like you're measuring the diameter of the tree. But instead of telling you that diameter in inches or whatever, it tells you the carbon equivalence, like how much carbon dioxide is that tree absorbing every year? And we actually had the middle schoolers add up the total amount of carbon dioxide being absorbed by all the trees in their schoolyard. And it was a, a great event because it, it, everybody was working on it in common. All right, so what's the, what's the process? Not very hard. Uh, you can usually go to your school website, find the directions page. There's usually an aerial view of your school, something like this. Uh, this is Glenwood Elementary School in Battleground. Uh, has all the various different pockets of vegetation and uh, things like that. Uh, I print a copy of that. <clears throat> I get another piece of paper, tape it to it, take it up to a window. So you got light shining through from the other side. And now I can make a map like this where I can trace the edges of the buildings. I can put in all these trees and shrubs and things that are out there. Uh, if they look kind of grown together like that, that just requires a trip out there to see where their separate trees are and how many there are. Uh, and we get that basic map created. And then we go to a common source. Uh, I happen to like uh, Seek from iNaturalist. Um, it's a pretty wide database. It's a free app that you can put on your phone. You can go up to the tree leaves and focus in on it, take a picture, and it'll give you the most likely species and, and uh, family that it belongs to. Uh, and then we can use that and then we, we put in labels. It's probably a little bit hard to see. This happens to be a big oak tree. My, my oak label is in there. These are two sequoias. Uh, we just put an M on there if it's a maple. Um, but now we've got that. This is a collection of birch trees uh, in this particular um, area in there. So now we've got a map. And if, if we want to go visit that, we can. Uh, when they, um, if they're in that kindergarten class and they're adopting a schoolyard tree, of course, the big red oak tree right out front is a popular one, but they could all, each, each class could have their own tree and follow that through the season. So we found this very useful. Um, and uh, particularly in what I call opportunistic uh, science. Uh, that's things like our equinox that's coming up when we're gonna have equal day and nights. It's like a few days ago when we had, or a, a few weeks ago when we had Groundhog's Day and you're having other events going on, you can talk about weather forecasting and the changing of the seasons. Um, having a resource like this uh, at your fingertips just makes those opportunistic uh, opportunities just a little bit better. You know, which trees are going to get their spring leaves first? Which ones are going to have flowers? Um, but what, a, you know, uh, why are those evergreens uh, making it along? Taking a look at the bark patterns. There's, there's just a wealth of activities that um, you can do with these particular uh, maps. And we've, we've had teachers get very creative in, in how we put them together. All right, I think that's about it. Jane, um, this is an announcement we want to make about the garden tours, but we might want to do that at the very end. Is that right? Yeah, let's uh, let's open it up. We have about 10 minutes for questions from Mark. Okay. And then, right. then we'll get to some, uh, we have lots more information to share with you um, so that you have tools and resources with you when you go. So it, Feel free to unmute yourself. Mark, I'm going to take you off spotlight so that you can okay. see everybody. Yeah. And feel free to unmute yourself or put something in the chat if you have a question for Mark. Hi, I have a question. Yeah. So I was thinking about energy transformations in the garden, and I've, I've been thinking about water also and how kids can do other mapping activities besides just the plants. Do you Absolutely. have any experience with that? 
Yes, yes. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, and maybe a resource for you as well. Um, the Washington Native Plant Society, I'm on their education committee as well, um, has a wonderful diagram called the cycle of renewal. It's either in their fourth or fifth grade folder um, on their resources. And it specifically deals with those energy transformations helping kids understand that literally you can trace all energy sources back to the sun. Uh, it shows how they, uh, the energy and matter flows from the producers to the consumers and to the decomposers and where it's recycled. Uh, very nice graphics, very student friendly. I use it a lot. Would it be possible to put in the chat um, the link to the website that helps you figure out what the names of the trees are? Yeah, I think so. Or if it's an app, I'm not sure. It is an app, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I put some uh, other resources in there as well. So there's and, several resources you can use. Okay, yeah, there's more than one. Uh, I just happen to like the, the Seek one. It, it, it's fairly easy to use. And SEEK is a subsection of iNaturalist. So when you go to the iNaturalist uh, page and you can set up a project, uh, which is kind of cool. And you can track things over time and over years, um, right? We were gonna do, we can do that for schools in our region, right as COVID hit. I set up all the schools in, in iNaturalist, but um, COVID hit and we couldn't do that. So um, iSeek is a subset and your school district should be able to get those apps on your iPads or your laptops too. Yeah, when we did the Earth Day deal, we took out uh, Chromebooks um, and uh, used that. It has it there. Uh, I'm glad you put the Arbor Day one in there, Jane. It's got a carbon calculator that you can do separate. We so we had the measuring tapes, but then we also used the uh, Arbor Day's um, carbon calculator as well. Yeah, I know the Vancouver School District already has it in their app catalog. And I think Evergreen does as well. So if you're in those two districts, iNatural should already be in your app catalog. Otherwise, just reach out to your IT folks and then get that added through your firewalls. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I saw more recently that the Water Resource Center down on the Columbia River is giving away hydrangea cuttings. Yeah, I, I, saw that I don't too. know how many you probably know about this. Um, this weekend, if anybody right. wanted to start hydrangea cuttings. Yeah. We did um, at our high school, our environmental club tested all of our trees and measured them. And what they were trying to find out was was the amount of trees we had planted on the property comparable or equal or more than the paper we used in the building. Oh, nice. It was a really fabulous project. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of potential there, yeah. And I would say, uh, I can almost guarantee you that uh, all of your schoolyards, uh, I gave that example earlier about giving the kids the problem of redesigning their schoolyard um, with new information in mind. And uh, as much as I told Jane, we work really well with our maintenance and operations department. Uh, we have an agreement so that uh, they don't get in our way when we're doing school garden work and things like that. They also do things that are easy for them, right? And so quite honestly, many schoolyards are mostly non-native or specially selected street trees that are easy to take care of and not necessarily wildlife friendly or things like that. So now whether you can get them to change that is a whole nother ball of wax, but uh, having the kids investigate that and find it out is really well. Um, the Glenwood School that I'm closest to was built in 1956. We'd love to be able to replace it if we could pass a bond, right? Um, and, and the trees that they selected in 1956 are almost none of them are from the Pacific Northwest, That's right? Insane. They're they're all from the East Coast or they're from California or they're someplace like that. And they're wonderful plants. They're cool. They're different, right? But they're not native. They don't support native wildlife. And so getting the kids engaged in that idea that 
hey, these are cool things, but maybe we could do better. Maybe we could optimize our schoolyard with better selections. Yep, and if your community has an urban forestry department, um, they would be happy to help come to your school and talk to you about tree selection. We have time for one more question before we do some wrap up. Anybody else have a question for Mark? And Mark, maybe you can type in the chat when the next WSTA conference is coming up and where oh, that sure. will be located. Yeah. Amazing resources at that conference as well. Yeah, Johnny. Um, Mark, did you say that you used to work out of the Casey Center? Or you still do? Yeah. Those botanical gardens that are hooked to them are a fabulous place to take kids also. Because there's nine different gardens. They at the end they have all those composting ideas. And it's a field trip that I always take the high school kids on. And they they have to research a number of things, but they have so much fun out there. Who would we contact if we wanted to know more about the Casey Center? Oh, uh, great. Uh, actually, I might be one of the people um, just because the classroom teachers are so busy. So, uh, yes, I was one of the founders of the Casey program uh, 30 years ago now. Wow. Uh, and it's uh, served wonderfully and it's a great resource. Um, uh, you can just check in at the office just like you would at any school site and say, uh, I want to use the grounds. The botanical gardens are actually wide open. You can just go straight uh, there. Right. And, and there are some other neat features. I'm glad you mentioned the hydrangeas. Uh, we also have the Lower Columbia Estuary Program on um, site, and they uh, grow native plants for putting out in landscapes and doing that. Uh, I was just out there the other day, and they distributed in their last plant sale during uh, February uh, 23,000 native plant stems that are going out to the environment uh, in there. Yeah, really impressive. And, and they said it was a record number that they've done. Um, so that's a, a great partnership. Uh, the person who asked me about the energy transfer, uh, if you go out and walk the trails, that cycle of renewal diagram is a actual uh, trail sign that we have out there. There's also one about aquatic life at the ponds and forest life uh, in our experimental forest. So lots of good resources. Yeah, there is a, I put the link to the wildlife botanical gardens on the webpage. They ask if you go out with a group, a large group, yeah, just contact yeah, them, true. let them know, because um, they do have volunteer work parties out there. And so if you're going to have a group, just to let them know that you're coming and they are, they're happy to arrange that for sure. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Mark again, as well as Ian and Becca for, for hosting these with Stacy uh, Meyer from the ESD 112. Stacy really did all the behind the scenes work um, for getting this ready. So now I'm gonna put a bunch of stuff in the chat, so bear with me here, um, but I wanna make sure that you have access to a lot of resources that our presenters are throwing at you. I know it's a lot of information, so bear with me, but. Um, as a reminder, the, uh, the Lower Columbia School Gardens, that's Ian's group up in Longview, uh, they are based at the North Lake Elementary School. So if you want to contact Ian and his team um, and tour the North Lake, it's beautiful. Uh, but there's lots of inf information on Ian's website as well as their resource page, including curriculum cheat sheets, amazing information there from Ian. So Ian, thanks for you and your team putting that together. Uh, Becca presented for session number two with the uh, Washington State Extension Master Gardeners Program. And her information is here. Once again, a whole lot of things, especially if you want to start a school garden, if you want to get ideas on where to get materials and partners, there's information there. Um, uh, we have the WST already in the chat. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the uh, Clearing Magazine or the Clearing Journal. It's the Pacific Northwest Environmental Education uh, Journal. Um, and I'm going to put that link in there because uh, they, you can read all their back issues online. Uh, the last, they usually come out quarterly. The last issue was on our Indigenous partners in the Since Time and Morium. Uh, curriculum and how to implement that on your school grounds. So if you haven't read the last issue, it's got a beautiful picture 
of someone holding a cluster of camas bulbs and leaves and flowers. Gorgeous issue, lots of information. The next issue that's coming up in about two months will be on green schoolyards. And we pulled about 15 articles together specifically about green schoolyard resources from uh, all over the region, Idaho, Oregon, Washington. I think we might even have a British Columbia uh, author in there as well. So check out Clearing Magazine. If you if you aren't familiar with that, uh, always great information in there. Um, and then E3 Washington is the Environmental Education Washington. Um, if you're not familiar with them, I'm putting that in the chat because they have a conference um, that is always full of amazing ideas. And their website has some information. They are closely connected with uh, ESD 112 and Elizabeth Schmitz up there. And then the last one I'm gonna put in uh, so I don't inundate you too much, but uh, the Lower Columbia Nature Network, we are a coalition of regional nonprofits, stakeholders and agencies to connect our community to nature. And we created several resource uh, pages for educators. And so there's two there and they link you with our partners. Many of our partners, thank you for adding the Confluence Project, yes. Um, uh, these folks will come to your classroom and teach in your classroom. They'll take your kids out to your school grounds and they also have field trips. So the Lower Columbia Estero Partnership is a great example. If you want them to take you to Vancouver Lake, um, they'll come to your classroom and teach you about the lake, teach you about watersheds and then take you out. So there's plenty of pre-learning. So when you actually get out to the site, the kids are ready to go. And we know that for many kids, um, especially in our, our lower income, they've never been to Vancouver Lake as an example. So let's get them out there um, to connect with those resources. Um, I think that is all the major links I want to send you. I remind you to make sure you've completed all three homework assignments that I put in the chat earlier. Those have to be done with some content that you researched, um, and those have to be done by March 8th, if you could please. I know you're all incredibly busy, but that would help us get the information back to Stacy so she can uh, give you credit for your clock hours. If clock hours are not uh, a uh, a concern for you, then don't worry. Um, but if you're missing something, please just reach out to us and let us know. Okay. Uh, one other resource I mentioned I'm going to share with you is uh, the upcoming March 21st. And then we'll have Mark talk about the garden tours. But March 21st is John Muir Laws. He just emailed me. We're going to meet this week to hammer out the uh, uh, meeting agenda. Um, the, the first link is to register for the the uh, Zoom meeting with Mark, uh, with Jack, and um, he goes by Jack, even though his name's John. And the second one is just more information. He's got teacher resources on his website too. Amazing, he's got a great book if you wanna buy. Um, so feel free to, to register for that. It's a limited audience. So if you wanna attend, sign up quick. Um, Mark, you wanna talk about the school garden tours really quick? Yeah, let me uh, get my screen going again. Okay, uh, as a follow up to this, um, we've got some school garden tours. There's been some in, in the past, uh, but trying to organize them a little bit better. Uh, I get to kick off the uh, group in uh, April and we'll be going to, it, it says Glenwood Elementary here, but uh, we have conjoined um, campuses in Battleground. So the middle school is right there, Lauren Middle School as well. and um, uh, Glenwood is kind of uh, unique uh, and it's an example of a garden that was crammed into a fairly small space really I tried to make it an example of a uh, um, not too complex easy to take care of uh, not in the way of anybody else kind of garden and yet we get huge mileage out of it as you saw my previous videotape while we were uh, working with the classes there and then uh, the Lauren Garden is actually installed with a Washington Native Plant Society education grant uh, specifically for native plants. So it was a restoration that replaced about a quarter acres of a giant blackberry infested patch with uh, all native plants, all with uh, uh, the students being part of the design and, and put together. And that was our center for our uh, Earth Day activity uh, last year where we got started, uh, everybody started out in the native garden. Um, so I'll, I'll be kicking that off in April. And then as you can see, we've got uh, Hazeldale Elementary and Illahee 
and then we just uh, recently added uh, Home Link, River Home Link, and uh, Battleground as well. Great, thanks, Mark. That's going to be a great tour. Um, there are lots of other examples in the community. So if you need to know where there might be a school closer to you that you can go look at and see examples, and some are small and some are really extensive. If you want a, a full blown platinum level school garden, go visit La Center High School. They've yeah. they've done it big up there. Rebecca Morris is the teacher up there. Um, I am now going to put in the chat the attendance poll, and it's got a few extra questions. So please feel please take a, a few minutes to, to fill that in for us so that we can learn how uh, this session went for you, what we can do better, and um, what information you would like to learn about in future sessions for clock hours or just for information. So once again, thank you to Ian, Becca, and Mark. We really appreciate the vast amount of information. Uh, we'll get this video up on the website um, that I put in the link uh, for the Lower Columbia Nature Network YouTube channel. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, um, if you have any questions. So this is the final session for this series, but we'll have more series. We're we're trying to get you information in the winter, and then as soon as the daffodils start popping, we get everybody outside to start uh, seeing and, and learning things hands-on. Um, and if you are interested in a, a tour near your school, closer to maybe the, the existing schools that Mark just showed you, uh, we can find ways to get up closer to your school so we can find some examples closer to you. I'll keep the call open for a few more minutes um, to answer any other questions that you might have. But thank you again to all of you for all the work that you do. We know you have a ton on your plate and on your shoulders guiding the next generation of kids. But the work you do is so important and we are happy to share the resources that we have with you so you can do your job better and get those kids outside. Thank you very much and we appreciate all that you do. Have a great day. You know.